good morning, everyone. This morning we have with us Professor Robert Lieber, who for 38 years has served our community. Professor of Government and International Affairs, he previously served as Chair of the Government Department and Interim Chair of Psychology, and is the author or editor of 17 books on international relations and U.S. foreign policy. Bob, we've had the privilege of working together for a long time, nearly four decades. As you move into retirement, I want to begin by thanking you for all that you mean to this place. Now, over the years, one embodiment of that is the, the way in which you've mentored so many students in their research. Can you talk about your approach to mentored research? Yes. Um, um, some of it's a bit of tough love, and on a couple of occasions I've had although I do not try to produce it, students actually break down and cry in my office when I told them that the draft of something they gave me was unreadable and that they would have to rewrite it. But I said, the good news is that a good, good uh, writers are made, not born. And that the way to get better is to practice and, and do repeated drafts. I began, whether it's undergraduates writing a, a term paper or a thesis or graduate students, by saying that you need to have a question. Uh, you can't just be describing something, but uh, the topic you're dealing with ought to end with a question mark. Um, secondly, it's absolutely pivotal to have an outline before you begin to write. Uh, if you don't have the outline, then uh, the, uh, there are whole libraries full of material that you could be using, and how do you differentiate in terms of what is relevant to your work and what not. And then finally, don't give me anything that's not your best written draft, because I and other readers will get hung up on issues of style, syntax, repetition, even grammar, um, if you're not careful. And that nobody's first draft, including my own, is ever a good enough. And that's why I try to leave them with that message too. Sure, thank you, thank you. Now, almost, almost two decades ago, you and Rabbi White helped us to establish the program for Jewish civilization. And in 2016, we had a new special milestone as we launched the Center for Jewish Civilization. Can you talk about that work in 2003 and mm -hmm. now what the CJC has enabled us to do here at Georgetown, why it's been such an important part of our mm -hmm. I'm delighted you asked me that question. It's, a, it's, a, it's important to me, and I think it's had an important positive impact on the university as a whole. It also reflects what I said at the beginning when you asked me about the signature of the university and what it meant to me. I found from the beginning, um, as a scholar who's Jewish, I found the university completely open to me. I never felt at any time that I was at the university on sufferance because it's Catholic and Jesuit. Georgetown's tradition, going back to its origins, has always been one open to other faiths and religious traditions and ethnicities. And I certainly found that to be the case, that I, uh, I belonged as a member of the university rather than um, as, something, as a guest. Uh, Rabbi Harold Wright, who himself was a brilliant thinker and teacher, uh, at least as much for non-Jewish students, I might add. Um, Rabbi White and I came to you in, I think, 2002 initially with a proposal to create a Center for Jewish Civilization. Not Jewish studies, not Israel studies, but Jewish civilization. The point was to deal with the contribution of Jews over the ages, uh, and particularly in terms of international dimensions, across all the disciplines uh, and areas of, of human endeavor. It fit Georgetown, I think, very well. And with your support, we got it off the ground at the time. Um, uh, other colleagues, Father John Langdon, uh, my uh, government department, Charles, uh, colleague Charles King, and I were the search committee for our first hire. We hired Jacques Berliner, Blauer's director. Um, later on, when it came time to try to turn the program for Jewish civilization into a center, um, there was a pivotal figure who was utterly indispensable. It was Bob Burkett, 
who is the senior advisor to you, senior advisor to the president of the university. Bob's capacity to share our vision with uh, others who could uh, understand what we were trying to achieve was unique. Without Bob, there would be no Center for Jewish Civilization at Georgetown. I can say that with confidence because there have been other earlier efforts to build a, a program of some sort, and they had uh, none of them had been successful uh, really prior to this. The one exception had been something that uh, Father Timothy Healy uh, cared a lot about. Um, he was, after all, your mentor, as well as a, an inspiration to me. He was president when I arrived, um, was the creation of the what became the Goldman Visiting Israeli Professor. And Tim had a, um, a big role to play in that, too. But without Bob Perquette, without your support, without what we had crafted on campus, without our ability to reach out across all the different campuses and departments and programs, this never would have gotten off the ground. But it's succeeded beyond our wildest dreams at this point. And under Bruce Hoffman, its uh, present uh, director, I expect it will go on to even better achievements. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for everything you've done to enable that to become a reality. I mentioned some of your books. Uh, in 2016, your book, Retreat and Its Consequences, <clears throat> the American Foreign Policy and the Problem of World Order, focused on global engagement and the role of the United States in the world. You're working on a new project on American foreign policy. Can you tell us a little bit more about your new work? Well, the new work, which I will be able to finish on, on schedule, even ahead of schedule, thanks to my retirement last month, is called um, Indispensable Nation, American Foreign Policy in a Turbulent World. And it proceeds by asking three questions. Remember, I said, I tell my students, you have to ask a question. Question number one is, after a 70-year period in which the U.S. world role was indispensable, at the end of World War II and establishing so much of what we consider to be the liberal international order in uh, forming alliances, in overcoming the Soviet Union in the Cold War, in creating a more decent world order, is the U.S. role in world affairs still indispensable, yes or no? Second, with all that's changed, second, if it is, is indispensable, do we still have the capability to play that role, given the fact that the, uh, what's going on in the world now is very different from any past era, certainly in the last um, uh, 70, 75 years? The rise of China as a potential great power competitor, the uh, actions of revisionist powers, uh, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and others who simply do not accept the rules of the game or what it means to coexist in a decent world order. Um, and in addition to these outside pressures, whether internally, there are things happening now in America which call our ability to play that role into question. Polarization, political paralysis, deep cultural division, an unwillingness or inability to understand Amer what America's historic contributions to the world have been. Um, and so that's the second question. Are we still capable of playing that role? And the third question is, if we're not capable of playing that role, what are the likely consequences? My answers to the tentative answers, I should say, to the three questions, since any honest author will tell you he or she doesn't really know uh, the answers until well, the writing is done and I'm in the middle of it. The answer to the first question is, I think, yes, we are ind indispensable for sustaining a decent world order, one that's more prosperous, less violent, um, uh, more observant of human rights and political freedom, more orderly, uh, less conflictual. Second, are we still capable of playing that role? In the past, I would have said yes unhesitatingly. We have we retain the material capacity, but the external pressures and even more importantly, the internal problems of our society call this whole world into question. 
it's not at all clear whether we're still capable of playing that role any longer. And then the third question is, well, if we're not, what are the consequences? And to be blunt, and you know, if, if nothing else, I'm not reluctant to call something what I call as I see it. If, if we're not capable of doing that, I think the consequences will be nasty, nasty for other questions and ourselves. I think our own national interest will be adversely affected. The world will be a less prosperous, more dangerous, more violent, more disorderly place. And I think uh, that causes me considerable concern. So those are my tentative answers to these questions while well, I'm still in the middle of writing. Well, we're all looking forward to seeing, seeing this next book. Um, Bob, you're in the earliest days of retirement. What's next? What are you looking forward to in the time ahead? Well, uh, a friend of mine said, who retired before I did, and quite a number of my academic peers uh, retired before I did. I'm younger than most of them, although I've been around, I've been at it a long time. My first lecture to a large lecture course as an assistant professor in California took place exactly 52 years ago this month. So I thought it was time to uh, hang, hang up my spikes, to use a baseball metaphor. Um, the first thing I need to do is um, uh, finish this manuscript. Uh, I have a contract with Yale University Press. Um, I anticipate the book will come out in the fall of next year. Uh, again, everything goes smoothly with the whole editorial process, polishing, production, um, and so forth. I'm also mindful of what a colleague at the University of Chicago said to me about retirement. He said, the first year and a half will feel like an extended sabbatical, and then you'll have to figure out what you really want to do. <laughs> I want to do a number of things. I would like to read a great deal more about areas I know less about than I would like. I would like to delve much more into America's founding um, and the, uh, uh, the history of America, political history in the, uh, from the mid 1700s up and through the mid 1800s prior to the Civil War. Uh, there's a lot more reading I want to do. I certainly expect I'll continue to do a great deal of writing and speaking and post pandemic um, uh, traveling. I continue to get invitations. And I, um, one advantage of being retired is I, I won't have the, the problem of me to even get back for class. <laughs> um, I've told colleagues if they need me to fill in for a guest lecture, uh, I'm always glad to do that. But I'm not aiming to do, uh, to teach another course. I think I've, I've paid my dues. I want to improve my tennis game. And I'm sure I'll find other things to keep me busy. I'm never short of things to do then and now, and I, I'm pretty confident that will still be the case. Sure, sure. But Bob, what, what advice would you give to the new members of our faculty as they're beginning their journey at Georgetown? That's a great question. I have thought about it. Um, I would tell them that Georgetown is an incredible place and that they should bend over backwards to reach outside their program or department to get to know people elsewhere in the university, um, to take part in various activities, whether they're teaching, scholarship, programs, uh, whatever, uh, that widen out their circle. I think the, the pressures on uh, new faculty are often intense. Um, to publish or perish, and publish or perish is not just an expression, it's a reality, as we, as we both know. Uh, and of course, one's personal or family pressures uh, at the same time, which are often considerable at that stage of life. But nonetheless, to try to make every effort um, to uh, have the wider view of what it means to be a professor uh, as a teacher, scholar, and colleague. When I was starting out, both as an undergrad at Wisconsin and a graduate student, especially at Harvard, uh, what impressed me was that the people who I looked up to, uh, my mentors and others, saw themselves in those terms, not just uh, alone to be outstanding uh, teachers or authors and scholars with national or international reputations, but to embrace the university as a whole. Uh, I think of uh, Leon Epstein at Wisconsin, 
and George Mossy at Wisconsin. I think of um, my thesis mentor at Harvard, Sam Beer, or Carl Deutsch, or Stanley Hoffman. Um, all of them were actively engaged in a much wider sense of things, rather than a narrow focus on their, on their own work. Uh, Isaiah Berlin uh, wrote a book called The Lion and the Fox, drawing on an old Greek uh, uh, tale. Um, and it describes two types of personalities. Uh, the fox, the, let me think, the lion and the fox. Hedgehog. Let me make sure I get it right. Huh? Hedgehog. hedgehog and the fox. Thank you for the correction. Oh, the hedgehog right. knows one thing, one great thing. Um, the fox knows many things. Um, these are questions of temperament and intellect. I've always seen myself in the latter category. I learned to master an area, but always asking myself questions about that go well beyond my subject into the wider discipline and the wider world. And I would suggest that's, from my standpoint at least, least useful advice for new faculty. Wow, thank you. And again, I can't thank you enough for all these great, great years of friendship and service. And in closing, Bob, is, is there one word you'd like to share with our community as we begin this new fall semester? Yes, there is. It's a, a couple more words than that. It's three words from the University of Wisconsin, which are on a plaque on the uh, main Bascom administration building from the regents of the university around 1900. Sifting and winnowing of ideas. In my judgment, that is the purpose of the university and the scholarly career. And I think there's a danger in where we are right now that the passion for social justice and the passion for public engagement at times risks creating an atmosphere which loses sight of the critical importance of the engagement over ideas, the healthy, robust debate without which truth cannot be found. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for taking this time to be, to be with us and we wish you the very best in these early days of your retirement. And I want to thank you all for joining us for this conversation this morning. I look forward to being with all of you again soon. Take care of yourselves. Take care of everyone around you for every day, everywhere.